All right, all right. So I had problems uh, downloading it. Uh, the file was too big. But, dude, I'll go ahead and drop a, um, a link for that video for anybody. Everybody's going to watch this. I'm going to drop the link for that, so don't worry about that. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Yo, what's going on, Alex? Que pasa, Mufasa? Oh, man, just here. Uh, it's excited to, uh, to get into this. I know it's a hot topic conversation at the moment. And I'm hoping we can shed some light and some clarity. Um, but there's a lot going on, man. It's uh, middle of the day here in Florida. And uh, just excited to be here with you, bro. Yeah, man, I appreciate your, um, you know, dropping by. And anybody who's coming on live, I appreciate you. Go ahead and subscribe at YouTube, The Reform Block. Uh, we are a new uh, podcast community. Uh, we are uh, an urban podcasting community and a collective of brothers under a common purpose to what? To see the kingdom of Christ influence, not just my life, not just your life, but every aspect, every neighborhood, everything we see in this life for the what? For the good of man, right? Mankind and to the glory of God. So that's what we're all about. So uh, please uh, like, share, share comment and uh subscribe below i'll drop the links uh you know for the reform block and you'll find us on uh you know our pages on on twitter so go ahead and um hit the uh, description and you'll see all the links i drop below there so uh real quick uh alex um we're waiting for other people to come on so uh real quick uh you know since it's just me and you why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself let, let us know who you are and what you do real quick um, at the moment, uh, just to uh, let everybody know, I'm a layman at the moment, um, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing my studies in scripture and, and uh, growing in the church um, to serve the Lord and his people. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I go by also uh, through Instagram, Facebook, and also on Twitter as the Presby Proselyte. I am, uh, uh, I've been walking with the Lord for some time now. Um, I am Presbyterian by conviction. Um, and that's pretty much it, man. I'm a father of four children. <laughs> um, I read. I'm reading a lot of things right now and growing in the faith. Um, I'm recent. Amen. I'm also a recent. Uh, recent covenant theologian convert. <laughs> All steps. The, yeah, man. So, uh, uh, you know, th that's the road that I'm walking on now, man. Uh, ex, uh, ex Pentecostal, ex charismatic. Ex <laughs> <laughs> All um, steps. I, so I do have I do have um, uh, a lot of experience with regards to uh, what takes place in a charismatic setting, in a Pentecostal setting, in an ecstatic setting, um, and so I'm just you know just looking forward to like I said, bro, just sharing that information with the people and hoping uh, to open some people's eyes um, mm -hmm. to the truth and the reality of what it is that takes place uh, within that world, um, but also just bring them to Christ, bro. Orale, man, that's what's up, and for those. Uh, looking to follow him on Instagram and on Twitter. I'll drop those links below too as well. So anyways, for those who don't know me, uh, my name's Jesse, a.k.a. The Chicano Knox. And oh. I <laughs> I am the host of Bible Theory Podcast, and that's on YouTube as well. Follow the link below and you'll subscribe there. And, you know, what I cover there is the church. I am a father of five as well. i married 11, uh, almost 12 years. I'm um, out here in Colorado, bro, in the mid Middle Earth, I call it. And I'm uh, just holding it down. I'm Presbyterian as well by conviction. And, you know, I just love uh, talking about the church, talking about theology. And, you know, uh, I'm so glad to join this new community to, uh, you know, bring everything todo con Sanson, bro. And that's what oh, we're Sanson. here for. Hit, hit us up, man. Use that hashtag, todo con, son, todo con san, Sanson, and, uh, you know, use it as you retag us and uh, share this video. But thank you so much for joining. All right. So we're going to go ahead and talk about something crazy, crazy that's going on. Everybody knows it. There's been videos. There's been, like, everything uh, under the sun about it. And you already know what it is, right? And that is the revival that's going on, right? And that's called the Ashbury Revival out there in Kentucky. And real quick, uh, uh, Alex, what are your thoughts about it? What, what are your um, updates on it? Um, by now, it's like, what, day 12, two weeks almost? 
Yes. 150 plus hours of live streaming yeah. on YouTube. Uh, tons of videos. Uh, good comments already has been made. Tons of videos coming out from conservatives and liberals and, you know, all kinds of stuff blowing up on Twitter on it. Uh, what are your thoughts, bro? Go ahead. Let me know. Uh, I think that we can break it down because there's so many things to say. Uh, I think we could just start from the beginning. You know, um, mm. it started it started by uh, by a 30 minute, 25 minute um, talk that was presented at a chapel at Asbury, uh, Asbury Theolo Theological Seminary. Um, they began to then worship after that. And it's been, what, 12 days now? 12 days. Uh, so it's, it's definitely made a lot of a lot of noise. And it's also spread to other campuses, um, not Asbury uh, campuses, but other uh, Christian uh, universities or Christian colleges. Um, I believe Lee University, I think uh, Samford, uh, um, I believe there's another one, Campbell. Um, so this is something that is uh, catching on. Mm. Um, and a lot of people are joining and doing the same thing. And... From the get, um, we want to go ahead and, and make the statement that it is not wrong to have the desire to worship God, to gather with the saints. Um, it is not wrong for us to to uh, to want to, you know, enjoy the presence of God in a sense. Right. Just to use that term. Um, so we're not here necessarily to condemn, but we want to shed light on mm -hmm. what is and, and actually. We spoke about this a few weeks ago in the reform block. What, what is worship? Um, right. But my thoughts on it are it's very easy for you to com to confuse um, where it is that you go to find the presence of God. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily have to go to a place to because God is not necessarily more there than mm -hmm. he is here. Right. Um, and I think that it um, also speaks to the condition, the spiritual condition of the people that want to flock for signs and wonders. Um, I'm going to massacre the, the, the verse. Maybe you can help in bringing it up. Um, but a wicked generation seeks for a sign. Um, and I think that that's very important here because people are so consumed with looking for a move of the spirit. They're very consumed and obsessed with what it is that God is doing in an external sense. Um, you know, so I think that Understanding that we find God that in many ways and many times, as the scripture says in Hebrews, God spoke to the fathers in many different ways and in many different forms. But now he has spoken to us through his son and his son is the radiance of his glory. He is the word of God, the word incarnate, the word made flesh. And so we need to have a standard um, by which we can all agree that God has and is definitely speaking to the soul. And it's found through the scriptures. And so when we start to remove ourselves from what it is um, that God has said in the scriptures, we find ourselves in murky waters. Um, we, we then create a sub, we put authority in a subjective experience as opposed to the objective truth that is found in God's word. And that's very dangerous because then you lose um, the purity of the gospel. Um, you lose the authority of the gospel. You lose the impact of the gospel that it's supposed to have within the heart. Um, and so anybody can literally do and say whatever it is they want, whatever it is that is right in their own eyes, um, because you're removing yourself from that which God has given to us uh, to order um, and organize and live our lives through. Amen. And you know what? You know, this is a big topic. Like you said, and I don't think we're going to cover everything, but we're going to try, okay? We're going to try our best. And there's going to be people popping up on and off maybe yeah. later on in the, in the show. Uh, but don't forget to like and subscribe, and thank you for your support already. And obviously, we're going to get to other topics, too. We're going to talk about revival. We're going to talk about, obviously, um, we're, 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 uh, I'm not sure if everybody watched the Super Bowl. Obviously, it, 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 you know, there was a commercial. Obviously, there's tons of commercials, but there was this one particular commercial called he gets us and we're going to be talking about that so we cannot wait man so yes yeah, so let, let me go ahead and you know just you know google real quick what is revival from a generic perspective so people could have a generic understanding of the definition of the word revival you go, you, you could look it up it basically just means from a generic point of view it means an improvement in the condition or 
strength of something. So it's just an improvement in the condition and the strength or the strength of something. And, and you know what I mean? And for those looking for, for, oh, what does the Bible say? Well, I got your back like a chiropractor. Check it out. Uh, Psalms 85 verse 6. Um, it uses, the Bible uses the word revive a lot. And um, I guess this concept of revival eventually comes out from the word revive. Uh, it comes out also from other patterns in scripture uh, where people come back to to the true worship of God because the nation of Israel falls away, right? And the nation of Israel is just, obviously it applies to the nation of Israel, but also you could look at it from a broader context as it applies to the human condition. You know, you could look at Israel like, yo, that's me right there, right? Like I'm, I'm like Israel, I fall away. You know, like that one hymn, Lord, um, I, I I feel like I'm going to wander away. Um, I think I butchered it. <laughs> um, prone to wonder, Lord, right? Prone to wonder. Yo, yo. And then Psalms 85, verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Question mark. That word revive. You know what I mean? Psalms 80, 19. Restore us, O Lord, of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And then the New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double, you're double-minded. So like the, the concept of revive, return, reformation, revival, um, you know, being strengthened again in your faith. Those are the concepts that people go to in the Bible, like those little two or three verses that I just mentioned. So that's just a basic understanding, a basic generic point of view. So if you're just watching this video and real quick, there it is, revival. But I do want to highlight something. Um, and Alex, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. There is a difference, isn't there, from worshiping God and going to church and finding strength, right, when you read the Bible versus, you know, like revivalism, right? Revival and revivalism. Right. Yeah. The, the, there's that three little word right there. It's called ism. Um, there is a difference. And I know you said you have background. You have your background in, in Pentecostalism. There's another ism. Right. And charismania, charismatics and stuff like that. So what do you think is the difference between revival? As I just pointed out, the Bible says revivals again, oh, Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. And versus revivalism. Wh right. What do you think are the generic uh, distinctions for both. Yeah, I think that uh, it's important for us to go back to scripture, like you had mentioned in Psalms 85, 6, where it says, will you not yourself revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? And so there you have uh, David crying out, asking the question, will you not revive us again? And that speaks to um, the many conditions that we find ourselves in. We may find ourselves in depression, loneliness. We may find ourselves backsliding in sin. We may find ourselves uh, completely wayward, um, or you may find yourself just in a funk, spiritually speaking, and you have the desire within you that is that is given to you by the Holy Spirit for you to be able to cry out to God because it's something that you feel in your heart, right? Um, and you know by the fruits of your life that you're crying out to the Lord so he can revive you, right? What does that mean? That means that he can um, uh, soften your heart, remove sin, remove pride, so that you can come back to him with joy, right? You can continue to have your eyes focused on the word, focused on Christ, on his kingship, on the sovereignty of God to revive you to him, right? To, to bring life into your, into, your, into your heart, into your life, into your situation. Revivalism, I would say, is when you are going outside of scripture to find that life. When you're going outside of scripture to remind, to, to be uh, filled with a with a fervor or a frenzy um, to get jolted by some form of energy um, or some emotional emotional feeling, um, some emotional intensity um, that uh, can only be provided by the gathering of people that aren't centered necessarily on Christ um, outside of the local assembly and those means which God has provided. Uh, regular means that God has provided for us to have that revival. 
um, that personal revival, right, with the Lord on your day-to-day -day walk, where you're going through trials and the, and the Lord through his word and through prayer and through private worship um, and dedication to the Lord, you're able to find joy. Your, your, your mind is able to go from, uh, why is this happening to me? Why is my heart so troubled? And you're able to focus on the glory of Christ and say, God, you have you are sovereign over all things. You have allowed this to take place in my life. And I rejoice in my condition, regardless of where it is that I find myself. And so I think that there's a misplaced, um, they, there's a misunderstanding when it comes to revival, where they think that it's something that happens externally, as opposed to something that happens within you as you go into the word and to prayer. Um, and right. even to a brother, when you can, when you're confessing your sins, so all of these are means by which God actually, um, revives the soul, revives the heart, repentance, right. word, uh, per personal uh, dedication. Amen, bro. And then, you know, going back to the Bible as, as people were saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about the Bible, bro. Well, here we are. Ready? Check us. The Bible shows us patterns of, of, uh, of a coming back to God as, as a, as a, as a recovery of the worship of God, right? And you see this most clearly in the kings and leaders of Israel, the nation of Israel. You have one king coming to power, ruling the world, ruling Israel, for example, and he's just leading everybody astray, building high um, pagan temples and high places and leading everybody astray and causing massive walking away, you know, to use evangelical language, walking away from true temple worship, true worship to God, right? And then you have another, you know, that that you know, another leader comes up and he's like, oh, no, we need to destroy those high places. We need to bring those idols down and come back to Yahweh, come back to the I am that I am, come back to the true nature of God, the true worship of God, come back to that true temple fellowship, right? And, he, you know, so that's kind of like a picture of the negative and positive the swinging of the pendulum in Israel that you see constantly. And that is another concept where people get revival from. But like you said, this actually goes into, you know, the, the concept that many people are out there are getting and saying, dude, you're talking about the Asbury revival. Okay. I get it. You know, there's a negative positive aspects of this, but it's like, why are you guys talking like, like throwing shade on this like are you guys against revival uh you know what i mean that's very bad for you christians yeah. to go against christians that's right. antithetical to the gospel you guys are not loving your neighbors mostly your christian neighbors so i want to make a disclosure to say that we are not against revival we are against revivalism and real quick for people who are trying to figure this out revivalism i would put in a category of of uh of chasing fads, F A D, fads, you know, like fashion trends. Yeah, looking for the next wave, looking for yeah, the next the, wave to, to ride. The, yeah, the next wave to surf in, in, in Christianity, or you want to call it fadding, fadianity, <laughs> fadianity, where, where, where you're cruising the next wave, you know, and, and what's next, you know what I mean, in the ocean of Christianity. And that's revivalism. Revival is 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 tearing down pagan temples tearing down the 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 worship centers of idols and 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 drawing all those pagan followers into disciples of Christ making them followers of the true messiah making follow making them followers of the true Christ the true religion all that right that's the difference yeah right? i would i would even i would just to add to what you're talking about i would even remind everybody with regards to Nineveh what happened in Nineveh? The revival is not just something that happens where you just gather together with a bunch of people, raise your hands, and then just sing songs for days on end. There's repentance. There, there, it, it, there's an order to these things. And you see that true revival actually leads to reformation. A revival of the, of the heart, right? A revival is not just a personal thing. It's a national thing. What are the fruits of it? When you look at what is happening, for example, in, in Nineveh, just to use that as an example, Jonah gave them the gospel. He told them to repent. 
the king then repented and ordered everybody else, even the animals, I believe, were, were repenting. Right, but right. The whole entire, but but everybody was there was a there was a national outcry with regard specific to their sins, and they turned to Yahweh. And so there's where you see the distinction, right? Where you're not necessarily just uh, seeking, you know, uh, an experience, but God is after reformation. He wants to reform the nation. He wants to reform the peoples. Um, he wants to revive us again, right, in an intimate sense. But he wants to reform the nation, to bring all the nations are warring against, against God, against the Lord. And he wants reformation, which is what you were talking about. Um, and that includes repentance of the people, a coming back to scriptures as the order of things. Um, you have the destruction and the dethroning of man-centered religion. Um, you also have the destruction of all of the idolatry that may take place. And so the gospel begins by giving people the word of God. Right. Letting them uh, fall under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, leading to repentance, therefore leading to a, a, a regenerate heart, a heart of flesh that would then lead them to truly reform their way of life. Amen. So that I can be a better husband, a better father, a Christ-centered, God-honoring brother, um, serving the church uh, and glorifying the Lord were in the context of which I find myself in. And so that's a big difference. So we ask the question now, uh, what is it that this is going to then uh, lead to? Hmm. Yeah, and you know, we're, 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 I guess we're, for those who are joining in, we're talking about uh, the concept of revival according to the Bible. And we made it specifically clear that we are not against revival, that we are against revivalism. And we are not against uh, the recovery of holiness. And I think that's what you're talking about, Alex, is the recovery of holiness. And you know why holiness is so important for Christians? It's because our God is holy. <laughs> simple hello do the theological math you know holiness, the holiness is not found that in a place amen holiness is not found in the temple and the right. chapel of asbury right that's or, not or new york or new york or in or israel the holy land you know what right. i mean a lot of that stuff comes from like the medieval times where they attached you know the roman catholics they attach the word holy to everything Mm -hmm. The Santa, the Santa, you know, Santa, Santo this, Santo that, holy yeah. this, holy that. And it's like to be holy is to is to be set apart, to be set right, apart right. from what? To be set apart mm -hmm. from the darkness and the wickedness of this world and mm -hmm. unto God. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, but holiness is not found in a place, it is found in a person. Let the person let, let, let me go ahead and read Isaiah chapter 55, verse uh, yeah, six yeah, and seven. Yeah. Talks about this call to holiness this this true revival of the whole person listen to these words all right esv version check it out seek the lord while he may be found call upon him while he's near let the wicked forsake his ways let the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return to the lord that he may be that he may have compassion on him or her or the households or you know the nation and to our god for he will abundantly pardon so, yes, revival is real. Repentance is real. We, um, you cannot have a revival without a repentance of the whole man, of the whole woman, right? And, and, and chasing emotions, chasing the next wave of Christianity, the next fanianity, the fan, the, the fad, right? The what's in, that's not revival. I'm sorry. No. Revival is like what Isaiah just said calling the whole man out of darkness, calling him to a fellowship relationship with the true God, right? And that impacts his, his, his hands, his feet, his heart, and his city, his household, everybody. It, it impacts everything. And now I'm chasing fads. Do you remember the book of Jabez or the prayer of Jabez back in the 90s? For those who are young, you know what I mean? Everybody wanted to read that book. Yo, you're not a Christian. Yo, you don't, you, you don't have... Uh, you know, the true spirit of fire, unless you read that book, The Prayer of Jabez. Remember, it's a small little book. And then remember the next, when, when that went out of fashion, guess, guess what else came into fashion? The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. 
And everybody in every ministry wanted to read that book to find purpose in your life. And, and guess what? That book went away. Rick Warren retired. He's not even a pastor no more of Saddleback. There's other people. You know what I mean? That that fashion trend in Christianity went away. Exactly. Um, Will, uh, Willow Creek. Remember Willow Creek out there in mm -hmm. Chicago, outside of Chicago? Mm -hmm. Yo, you're you're not really a, a minister, or your ministry is not really legit. And if you, or maybe you want to grow your ministry, the best way to do it is do it the way Willow Creek wants you to do it. Because if you do it like that, it's going to guarantee success in your ministry. And then, and then that went away, right? So in Christian history, within the, the last 50 years, you had fad after fad, emotion after emotion, revival after revival, trend after trend, wave after wave, whatever you want to call it. That's in the history books. You can look it up. Where are they now, bro? Where are they now? For those who don't watch the Super Bowl, I'm going to use a Super Bowl uh, analogy. Forgive me. How many Super Bowls have there been, bro? How many Super Bowls have there been? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that question. Let's say there's been uh, 50. Okay. I'm sure there's more than 50. But let's just say there's 50. Do you remember who won the fourth Super Bowl? I don't know either. Do you remember who won the 13th Super Bowl? No, at all. Forgive me of my ignorance of Super Bowl trivia. Those who are nerdy about the NFL and trivia, more power to you. But I use that analogy to, 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 to paint a picture for you to say, hey, those Super Bowl champions all had stud players on them. Would you, would, wouldn't you agree that mm -hmm. every Super Bowl champion had stud players? Where are they now? retired some of them passed away some of them are broke some of them are like homeless there's a couple of people a couple of nfl players that are rich and now they're homeless and broke mm -hmm. so the same thing in christianity there, there's been super bowl champion moments supposedly emotional high things and stud players and then you would say they're like you look them up now they're gone yeah the that high that that high to just mention that to to continue with that thought that you're sharing um, as a person, as a person who um, who before the Lord before the Lord saved me um, was using drugs uh, as a way of escape. You're you're constantly seeking for the next high. You're constantly seeking to match and exceed that first high. As a believer, people are doing the same thing. They're chasing that high that you get from the emotional experience. That's wrong. Because there's no there's no more ultimate experience than to uh, be sanctified by the reading of the word, mm. by the gathering of his people in the local assembly. And the yeah. fact that people are going and traveling to these places to find something, I, I see that that speaks to the to the weakness of the local body. Amen. Because if you if you had people that understood the importance and the power, the true power in the word of God mm -hmm. to save, to sanctify um, then you would not have this rush of people thinking mm -hmm. that they can be uh, filled, you know, in a in an actual place. And mm -hmm. so, what happens with that high that you get, that frenzy? Because I, I was just having this conversation the other day. You know, when you go to a party and they put on merengue or they put on mm -hmm. some bachata or they put on some some other balada, you feel like, you know, you feel like dancing. It gets you up. But what is it yeah. that's getting you up? It's not mm -hmm. the words of the song. It's the movement, right? Mm. It's it's the the sounds, the the the, the drum beat, you know, mm -hmm. the 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 melody and the emotion that the music kind of stirs up in you. But right. people think that 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 is how God works. And so I, there's I, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yes, 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 man. You, you're right, bro. People need to slow the road, bro. Like I always, uh, my old pastor gave me this one example. When you're when when um Albert County it gets it gets fogged up, bro. Like you, you can't even see like ten like five feet in front of you when you're driving down through Albert County out here in Colorado. What do you do when you cannot see five feet in front of you driving through Albert County? What do you do? Mm. You slow down, <laughs> slow down, okay. or otherwise you're gonna end slow up down. in the ditch. Yeah. Same thing in theology, you want to slow down. 
Because when you're working through the doctrine of God, it's very easy, bro, to end up in ditches. You you got you got antinomian over here. You got a uh, you know unitarian over here. You got to be careful on these ditches, bro. Yeah. And many of these people are just revival emotion, uh, you know, chasing the next the next trend, and they're not even considering the sacrifices that they're doing to the doctrine of God, right? Mm -hmm. The attributes, uh, you know, uh, you know his his holiness, his transcendence, all these things, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. where's the trinity in any of this revival talk right it's gone it's not it's not there and but people listen to me people will spend the rest of their life chasing this high of emotionalism they will continue to seek out this external emotional frenzy or energy to uh fuel them to uh live their life for christ as, as if that is the only thing, but the, what happens is that they confuse that with the presence of God because they're told that you don't have the presence of God unless you feel this emotion. And God doesn't make us to be robots, but we go to his word and let his word then uh, uh, control and rule our emotions. We're, our emotions should be subjected to the word of God. And so, yes, we're going to feel peace when we repent and we, and we know that we're reconciled. But what happens, the knowledge of God uh, uh, is what brings us that peace, right? Uh, repentance and reconciling with the Father is what allows us to say, okay, man, the Lord died on the cross for my sins. I no longer have to carry this burden. Therefore, that burden is removed. I feel peace in my heart. Why? Because my heart is reconciled with God. You know what I'm saying? I am found in Him. I no longer, I know now that I no longer have to stand before God and pay the penalty for my sins because Christ was uh, nailed to the cross for my sins. I'm treated as his son and Christ was treated as, as the one who broke God's law. And so um, there is a right emotion that we have, um, which comes from a proper understanding of doctrine in the scripture. And um, uh, the people, people that go there will continue uh, will continue to actually chase those fads, chase those emotions, uh, chase that wave um, for the rest of their life. And they will continue to struggle. Um, they will continue to lack purity in their heart. They will continue to, to find themselves um, uh, lacking the true essence of what it is to be a, a believer. And they will continue to um, need this revival you know, mm. I, I need to get my injection in order for me to mm. go ahead and proceed uh, with my day. Yeah, it's very addicting, bro, when you live high to high, Christian Christian emotion and emotion. But and, and, and I really want to just stress, you know, we're not against revival. We are against revivalism. And that's what we're talking about. The fads and the trends. We are against that because the fads and the trends, they come and go. We are against we are for sorry for real change, real revival of the whole man of the whole church that applies to everything holistically, right? So yes. but I and I do want to establish these things, you know, slowly because I don't want to move up quickly because people who are watching, this is a very touch touchy subject. So I, I really want to get this down as great as possible, right? And as best as we can. And I really want to make an argument from the positive perspective of why, bro? Why? Why do we need revival right now? Right? What is the argument for the need of revival? Not revivalism, revival. So, uh, if you want to go ahead and um, say that real quick, uh, sure, man. I mean, I need, I need, I need the Lord every day, bro. I need His Word. I need His Spirit to strengthen me. I am in desperate need of the Lord on a daily basis. Um, people are people are are uh, going through life and uh, through God's pro God's providence is 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 allowing us to uh, experience a lot of suffering, troubles, trials, depression, etc. Um, and so we have a a need where we become overwhelmed with the things of the world, when we become overwhelmed with our uh, our marriages, when we become over, overwhelmed with our children and, and, and the things that they're doing and as parents or f providing for our, for our family as men um, is very taxing on the mind and the body. Um, or just in the busyness of life, bro, we, you know, we, we, we can continue to uh, go along our day and then sometimes we forget 
to come back to the means of grace, right? To the, come back to the scriptures. But we need revival every day. Revive us again, O oh Lord. So it's not just in our dark moments, but in also our good moments. Um, every moment of our life, we, we are in need of God to revive us because we are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, as the hymn says, right? Um, uh, I know that there's another portion of scripture right. that's about the longing of the heart, right? To, uh, but we, we are constantly fighting our, our, our uh, flesh and temptation and walking away from the Lord. And the Lord graciously brings us back. So we're constantly in a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis um, being being pulled apart in different directions. And God is, uh, through his spirit, bringing us back to him, right? Look to Christ, look to Christ, look to Christ. Um, and so, yes, we are in need of revival on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment, uh, moment-to-moment basis. There's never not, there's never going to be a moment where we don't need uh, to, to be revived again. Yeah, yeah. You know what? There is an idea in Christianity that suggests that once you get safe, bro, it's like it's all green grass from here. It's all flying up with no turbulence. It's it's the perfect incline with with uh, fast food joints and, and everything on the way up. Right. It's just a straight line going vertically up. Prosper, prosper, prosper. Grow, grow, succeed, succeed. That's the type of gospel that most people hear and stereotype, which is false. Christianity is not like that. You know, the, if you read the Bible, just read and observe the life of Paul. And and um, you will observe that Paul did not have, the, you know, his best life now. Right. He suffered many trials, many tribulations, many, you know, he questioned he was like, yo, I don't even know if I was in the third heaven. And he's like, Lord, please take away this like thorn in the flesh. And the Lord said, no, you know, so he, he suffered many, many things. And I'm sure he, he was probably depressed and, and sad that he was like cold and, and abandoned in a prison. Right. And, you know, he, he's human. He, he That's negative. This, the Christian life is more like a like a uh, like an up and down, like an up and down, like bam, bam, bam. Oof, succeed, triumph, boom. Ah, oh, man. Get back up, succeed, triumph. Peaks, peaks, and val- peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Peaks and valleys, right, bro. And and, and that, I think that's why we need revivals. We need the gospel to remind us. Why do we need the gospel preached to us every single weekend at church? Because we forget, bro. We forget how God good, how good God is. We forget how great God is. We, we, we forget our history, where we come from, right? And we, you know, we forget all these things. So that's why we need the gospel being preached to us all the time. And we need revival all the time, personally, right? And otherwise, we have left to our own devices, you know, total depravity, bro. We walk away real quick, bro. We, we'll you know what I mean? We're, we're going to walk away uh, <laughs> faster than fast, you know, um, but we have... Oh, we have Aldo. Aldo. Aldo in the house. Hello. Can you hear us? I can't hear y'all. You can't hear us? We can hear we can hear you. Hello? Uh, I I hear I hear you. Hear you. But but you can't I can't you can't hold up. I'll I'll check your settings, bro. Oh, I think now. Oh. Yeah, can you hear us? Can you hear? Can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think you can hear us. Yes. I'll take them off real quick. So no, see, I'll take them off real quick so you could uh, fix that. Um, what were you saying, bro? Uh, why we need the peaks revival? In the, valley, the peaks in the valleys. Um, what? Why is it so? Uh, why do we need revival? Um, uh, every single day of our lives um so that's kind of like the conversation that we were having um you know god god does something god does something um he strengthens us in the peaks um so that we can be prepared um when when we enter into the valleys and then you know um he uh in the valleys then revives us and and brings us to a peak you know so life is not easy Life is not, you know, um, flat. Um, we're going to experience things in life that remind us to look to Christ. I'll bring um, on Aldo real quick. Okay. Aldo, yeah, can, y'all, can y'all hear me? Check, yeah, check. We can hear you. Yep. 
Okay, good. I can hear you now. So, awesome. uh, Aldo, uh, real quick, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, and what you do real quick, for those who don't know you. Uh, you see my shirt. Um, I play for PSG, France. No, I'm just <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Aldo. I'm a pastor in the PCA in Miami. That's about, uh, that's about it. All right, man. And uh, real quick, what we're talking about, uh, we're moving systematically, categorizing revival uh, based off the Asbury revival um, in general, but we're covering the diff. Um, I think we covered the difference between revival and revivalism. We talked about what the Bible says about revival. Uh, right now, we're, we're making a positive argument of why we need revival, either personally, uh, culturally, and then maybe why the concept of why we need revival is important. So I guess what we're talking about real quick uh, between me and Alex, we were just talking about how we grow, how we become born again, you know, following Jesus. And it's not a straight shot, right? It's, it's like up and down, up and down peace, peace and valleys, right, Alex. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we experience highs and lows, you know, our hearts are prone to wonder. We, we get pulled in seven different directions. We uh, sometimes we grow indifferent, um, you know, towards the spirit, towards the church, towards reading, reading the Bible. And that's probably an argument for, hey, man, you need to come back. Like Psalms chapter 80 says, revive us, O Lord, because we've grown indifferent to you. So maybe that's a positive argument to, to the necessary need for revival in your life to come back to the gospel again. Um, so that, I think that's what we're talking about right now. So, yeah, so, I mean, like revival, revival is something that happens over and over again, you know, in, in the Bible, you know, people recapture the gospel, they recapture worship, they recapture the, the crucial teachings of the scriptures, and then they become familiar, and then they become callous, and then they become syncretistic, and then syncretism leads to um, a total replacement or corruption of, of biblical worship and teaching and preaching, and, and then there goes the, the need for revival. But the thing about revival in a biblical sense, it's it's returning to the ancient past, as Jeremiah says. It's returning to the simple things that God used, you know, to uh, capture the hearts of God's people. Um, as opposed to, you know, I think the way we think of revival in America is a new measure, a new move of the spirit. Um, not, this is the thing, like, I, I, I'm going to do a podcast on this probably eventually. I'm, I, I feel like I, I have the, like a thousand reasons to do other podcasts. But um, historically, if you look at the Reformation or their awakenings, it was always something that about how God normally worked in the past that had been somewhat compromised or corrupted um, added to and, and revival being like, let, let, let's get back um, to the essential basics, not let's, let's, let's find some new extraordinary other uh, measure and means. Um, and so in some sense, like, I mean, you, you get used to the gospel and, and therefore revival is necessary in order for you to um, recapture the, the necessity of the gospel. And um, one of the things that you notice about Asbury uh, and all the testimonies is that it's very little of the people that are talking are actually saying things about the story of redemption and the doctrines of grace. They're, they're just talking about their subjective experiences and how, you know, they had these feelings and God, you know, took them away from those feelings. They had negativity and now they have positivity. You know, I went nothing from negative about, like, to positive, that biggie smalls philosophy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing about like um, you know, just just look at like like what happens like in, in the revival, you know, in, in Elijah's day. Like you see the altar you guys have built and, and your and your ways of conjuring up spirituality. He's like, let me build the altar of Yahweh with uncut stones, mm. you know, which which speaks about like you know the worship of God that is not made by man but is received um, from God to man. Um, but you know, if what you think about revival is 
in America, it's all these stones and uh, monuments that are, are pretty much fashioned and made by by ourselves. And yeah, yeah. is yeah, revival so that, after our own image and feelings and music? And yeah. it's like, well, God is not really all there, you know. And and, and revival is always about repentance, man. Like you look at mm -hmm. everywhere in Scripture, like even just Acts two, like they were cut to the to the heart. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? You know, like they, like when you see the stuff discussed about revival and what's going on with revival, very little bit is about like, man, we've offended God. Um, man, we, the, we, we have uh, violated his law. We have blasphemed his name. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, it's not set up idols. We've set up idols. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these, it's, all these it's, things. That's going back to what the Bible says, right? You know, and just rewind that video, this video, and you'll you'll see that. So yes, it, it, we we do acknowledge that even Christians experience the downs and the lows and the depressions and isolation away from the community of God. But that's why we need revival, like Pastor Aldo said. We're not against revival, and I want to make that super clear of like, oh, look at these Christians attacking other other Christians that's not loving, and we will get to the Asbury specifically here. But I just want to point out this one verse that made me um, think about what Alex said. is that Psalms 119.25 says, my soul clings to the dust. Dude, <laughs> give me life according to your word, Lord. Give me, give me life according to your word. Psalms 119 for you, verse 25. That explains the need for revival, spiritual reformation. Uh, prophet Ezekiel tells the Lord, uh, Lord, you know, God tells him, can these bones be made alive, right? And a lot of people point that out to the soteriology, you know, all that stuff. But like, the, he's like, no, only you know, only you know, Lord. So, so yes, revival is in the Bible. In the Bible, we're not against revival. Uh, of Christians, of, of people repenting, coming to God, we are against revivalism. That's the difference. Uh, specifically, Asbury Revival. Yeah, We talked about yeah. it. Let's get to it. Has the movement, has this movement been hijacked or is it legit? Anytime I mean, that, uh, anytime you see <laughs> I always remember when mounting when uh, Moses came down from the mountain and uh, mm -hmm. people wanted to hear the voice of God. Um, although I believe that you mentioned this uh, from the pulpit a couple of Sundays ago, they heard the voice of God to the point where they wanted to die. They said, "Moses, you know, um, you you go ahead and be and and hear God's voice uh, for us, lest we die." And when God truly does move in the heart like that, when it comes to that kind of experience, you always see the fear and the terror of the people and recognizing that they are about to die unless they have this mediator. And so it's a it's a terrible thing to fall into the heart, into the hands of the living God, in a sense. Right. So um, what these people are experiencing is not that it's a it's a frenzy that they're conjuring up. Uh, similar to a high that you get from drugs where they constantly will spend the rest of their life uh, trying to seek seek out something to make them feel uh, motivated to to do what they don't feel uh, compelled to do from scripture. So they're looking yes. for these they're looking for something that is going to nudge them in that direction that isn't Christ, that isn't from the word. Yeah. Um, and so what what's happening there, I, I would not call it to be scriptural. No, also and also too, like if you look at the the sermon that prompted the the so-called revival, it was a moralistic sermon about on on how we should love people and, and are you loving people? And I'm like, bro, like that show me anywhere in the Bible where a a pep talk on being a nice person is the the ground zero spark of revival. Like if you look mm -hmm. in the Bible. Like what sparked revival in Pentecost? It was a preaching of the ascended Christ, right? Uh, if you look at you know uh, the uh, the revival that happens you know early in Genesis, you know the city of man he you know he make he, he built a city after himself and his son, and then it says, and then with the other line, the line of Seth, that says that men began to call on the name of the Lord, like, and even just like historically, like what what brought revival. Uh, in in America and the Great Awakenings, if you look at like the, the uh, web of all the events, 
Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon on Romans 4 on being justified by the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that was like the, the spark of revivals. And then you look in the Reformation, people started preaching um, about, you know, the atonement because, you know, the atonement had been very much corrupted and made superstitious. So they started preaching the doctrines of atonement, you know, biblical atonement. So like revival is not sparked by, hey, guys, let's let's be nice people like the Bible says. And pretty much if you if you notice like what all the talk in there is, it's it's a lot of just horizontal kind of confessions, right? Not like a a recapturing of some high uh, vertical objective doctrine about redemption, but it's just a bunch of uh, you know sentimental moralism, you know. And that's one thing I, I've I've noticed is just even no, like no, the right. spark. Absolutely. We, we, um, there, you mentioned Jonathan Edwards in his uh, Signs of True Revival, um, number four, um, he gives and he says, and I quote, when men are led away from false, falsehood into truth, and he quotes First uh, John uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, and I quote, it say, he says, one is called the spirit of truth and the other is the spirit of falsehood, and he uses that as, as his point. To say that when revival happens, there is a massive um, exodus out from falsehood, false doctrine, incomplete doctrine, incoherent doctrine, unreformed doctrine, unbiblical doctrine, anything, heresy, falsehood, half-truths, all that stuff into the true doctrine, into the correct doctrine, true conformity unto what the scripture says, the 66 books, yeah. and to historical confessional yeah. Christianity, not just whatever you want, anity, yeah. um, however you like it, anity, fatty anity, anything like that. Jonathan Edwards said the true one of the true marks of, of, of revival is a, a massive exodus, exodus out of out of falsehood into truth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right? and what you're seeing here is the reverse of that. What you're seeing what you're seeing, of vagueness. <laughs> we're celebrating how vague spirituality is yeah you know, loving jesus it doesn't have to be defined it doesn't have you know it's it's it, it's revival always specifies that which is vague mm. like you said alex it's the opposite it's 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 making vague vague that which is specific um right, so right. much so, so like so if I if I have a, a false or or an ignorant view of the Trinity, if I say, no, no, Jesus is subjected to the Father and he is, you know, he's he's generated and or, you know, he's not really like as powerful as God the Father or, you know, the spirit is like an energy force or I don't even like a ghost. Or, you know, like if I start coming up with some weird stuff about the Trinity, that's heterodox or unorthodox if it's true revival i'm going to submit myself to scripture and be like coming to the true knowledge of the trinity right right that's what yeah. jonathan edwards is basically saying there, and i use the trinity as an example yeah there is there is growth in the scriptures there's a, there's growth in your knowledge of his word there's growth in your understanding of these these uh these truths so you're 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 constantly moving away from your emotions and from what you think and you're replacing and um and, and renewing your mind with what it is that we find in scripture yeah. and so it's exactly what we have mentioned before there there's going to be a a um, moving and a running towards Christ and a moving away from yourself which is what, what what was the topic of conversation yesterday right Aldo dethroning yourself so that and enthroning Christ yeah, yeah. and all yeah, it is that we do think or say. Yeah. And the thing is, it's kind of tricky because you notice like in a lot of like the testimonies and stories about it, Jesus is mentioned, but what if you notice it, it is your story that Jesus is revolving around, right? Not, the story of Christ that you are revolving around. So almost every testimony mm. is not exalting the narrative of Jesus. And I have, you know, I see myself being captured, defined, 
brought into that big narrative. It's all these stories where I am recruiting Jesus to this priority and superiority of my narrative and I'm giving him credit for it. And so um, that's, that's a, that's, that's revivalism. It's my experiences of Christ become the declaration and testimony about Christ as opposed to, I, I think biblical revival is I, I I'm, I, I've been brought to a deep awareness of the experiences of Christ for me. Right. And I, <laughs> I'm telling you about the greatest man uh, who is God and man and about his narrative and how it has just rewritten me into it. I'm not recruiting Jesus um, to be my cheerleader about, you know, all these horizontal things about myself. Um, and, you know, it, to me, like revivalism is, 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 is Luke 18. I thank you, God, that, you know, I am no longer, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, all, all this, like, just I, 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 um, with Jesus in the background. So, I, 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 I. <laughs> yeah. And you know that's what? That, we, we, that, we, brings, we, that brings, like, that brings us, like, that, my mind to the, to, uh, not to the next point, but, like, where I'm hearing you go, Aldo, is that, um, True revival of the heart, right, is a humility of spirit. Um, is that liver or a frozen gizzard or something? <laughs> These are dates, man. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me, but, myself, yeah. and I, the unholy yeah, trinity. It, yeah, all about you, but there's there, there's a true brokenness, right? Like, when you look at the prophets, like, woe is me. When, when, when you truly have a to use a spiritual experience is, is recognizing Christ is seated on the throne. And in light of his holiness, I see the sin that put him on the cross. And so that should lead not to a revivalism or to an emotional frenzy, but that should lead us to be um, uh, Christ centered fathers, Christ centered husbands, Christ centered employees, Christ centered employers. So there is a real tangible reformation that happens in the context with which we find ourselves in. Yeah. And so it's not something that you go, it's, it's like if, you know, these people are acting as if you can go to the store, buy and purchase something and bring, bring it so that you can share with your family. And that, that's not how, that's not how this thing works. Um, yeah. And so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, can't, yeah. you can't schedule revival. And it's kind of funny. This happens. That has happened to Asbury around the same time of the year, many times. Yep. So if, if if your revival is scheduled, it's not revival. That's not how it works. No one in the history is like, yeah, you know, that's Finneyism. That's Finneyism. But what we need is to conjure up, you know, uh, what is in man to then create, um, you know, th this kind of like supernatural fire. Um, and revival is never, I, I'm going to say this. It's not planned. This is obviously you can be praying, right, um, for God to move. But like most of the times, it's people are doing normal things that Christians should be doing, right? Like the means of grace, and um, you know, and God, God shows up. God shows up in in an unexpected way, and and when revival shows up, you don't want to stay in church all day long and sing songs and hug Good on the point. floor. Good when point. revival shows up. Just, just, just look at the Reformation. Revival showed up, and you know what? Society, families, marriages, everyday life look totally different. Revival shows up in the colonies, and guess what? People ain't going to the bars. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like that. That's what happened. Like when, 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 horizon, when, 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 when revival is vertical, like you see it horizontally flushed out in all of these spheres of life. Mm -hmm. When revival is humanistic, you're in this like weird trance of vertical, you know, kind of like trances of, of, of spirituality um, that, that, I mean, to me is very Roman Catholic. Like you wouldn't, what, what, what would you do? You would go to church all week long, all the time. You were always at church and the reformers were like, listen, God does not need your good works. Uh, your neighbors do. And so revival pushes you out uh, from, you know, the hallelujah uh, loopholes um, into life. So I'm saying like if, as, if, if there was true revival, 
that is utterly distinct and supernatural in Asbury, then, then that town um, would feel it. Not just this chapel, right? Um, and you wouldn't, I, I told you guys this on our, on our, our chat, like, Revival finds you. You don't have to find revival. You know what I'm saying? Like historically speaking. And I like, would even I would even say, like you mentioned the Roman Catholic experience with the trances, but I think that we can take it a step further, Aldo, because what else is there in the world right now um, that has these trances and these uh, these ecstatic utterances um, or these uh, emotionally charged frenzies um, uh outside of of what we would we would consider christendom you have these i say the buddhist the buddhist, the buddhist really? you have uh hinduism he is like that hindus uh you have african uh spirituality voodoo or santeria as it's called um where you have um even the uh Hare krishnas and um the people mm -hmm. were the yogis the, the 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 all of these the religions across the world are doing the same exact thing mm-hmm where they're different terminology, they're, you know, they're placing mm -hmm. their mind in a trance state where then they can open themselves up to whatever spirit it is that they worship to enter their body and then they roll around the floor making noises, etc. And so, mm -hmm. uh, to the as to credit the Asbury, in a sense, we haven't really seen that too much. For example, like in the Lakeland uh revival, I don't know if you guys remember what was happening in the Lakeland, Florida, with the Todd Bentley situation. Um, where there was a lot of people getting kicked and, and a lot of people rolling on the floor and the barking and all that stuff. Yeah. The carpet guys, biting. Did you, guys, did you guys hear about like that they would stop and turn to their neighbor and, 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 and speak visions over them? Nah, but I don't yeah, doubt yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see it, but what turn, what, turn, what? turn to your neighbor and prophesy, you know, visions over them. Like, bro, that's like witchcraft, bro. It is witchcraft. witchcraft. That's something. It is witchcraft. Bro. Right. It is witchcraft. It is. Yeah. And for those for those who are looking for resources of where we're getting all this information from, there's a great book uh, by Martin Lloyd Jones called Revival. Go ahead and check it out. Um, RC Spro and Ligonier has good articles and books on it. Go ahead and check out that Jonathan Edwards sermon on you know what true revival is. And those three or four resources alone will 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 help you, you know, rethink. You know, and reconsider your position if you're, you know, not from the reform perspective, for example. Did you but anyways also notice, uh, uh, continue? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, no, go I'm, ahead, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. I just want to throw that out there, you know. Yeah. Did you also notice the lady that that stated that uh, that she was convulsing, but then they they realized that she wasn't convulsing, but that she actually had a spirit, and that they were casting out the spirit um, in Asbury. Did oh, you you, oh yeah, yeah. You I saw the video. Up. Yeah. You open up something else. So if, if you see something, um, if you see something, say something. Lady of God's <laughs> fancy girl is making good comments. Um, yeah, shots out to her. Say, they keep attributing homosexuality, um, depression um, to spirits. So a lot of the testimonies is. My problem is that there is a, a depression spirit, there's an angry spirit, there's a gay spirit, and God delivered me from that. Again, like that, that's 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 like pagan spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. which doesn't right. see it's it's like pantheism, right? Like oh, the yeah, trees it, has the spirit, yeah, yeah. The, the bush and, has the spirit, the, the earth has the spirit. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, biblical Christianity like looks at Colossians two eleven, you know, he triumphed over you know. Uh, the uh, the principalities and, and put in the open chain, right? You know, mm -hmm. Hebrews 2, uh, he destroyed the one of the power of death, you know, and, you know, John 12, all, all those passages talk about, like, the spirits being exercised definitively in the ascension work of Christ. Um, and these people are constantly... Um, they're constantly having to control and conjure up and exercise dominion over like these rogue spirits. And they're constantly attributing their problems, you know, to um, some outside thing, you know, and again, like biblical mm -hmm. revival um, is not 
I thank you, Jesus, for all of these external things outside of me that you've kind of like, you know, Harry Potter wand waved away through like my like uh, um, charismatic, uh, you know, uh, intuitions. But woe is me. Mm -hmm. It's woe very is convenient. Me, wretched man yeah. mm -hmm. that I am. And they were cut to the quick and say, brothers, what shall we do? Like mm -hmm. biblical revival is when you come to grips with the fact that you are the problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. You are the problem. Right. right. Yes. And you ain't exactly. blaming nobody else. Right. right. And um, that's exactly and what these spirits do. That's what these spiritual, the spiritualization does. I'm sorry to interject, but just to mention that the point that you're making, Aldo, is that when you start to now talk about spiritual beings, um, possession, the exorcism and all that, people are not uh, taking responsibility for their sinful actions before mm -hmm. a holy and righteous God. And so they're saying, I did this homosexual act, or I did this um, horrible act, or I did this. I had, a, I had a cussing demon. I had a cussing demon. I had a sex demon. I had a homosexual spirit. <laughs> a sex so demon. All, all of these, but we're, we're laughing and it is funny, right? Bro. But it's real. I, yes. yeah, yeah, there are people that are saying, I committed adultery with against my wife because this demon raped yeah. me. And so. Bro, I had a. Yeah, they needed therapy. I, I was at a meeting one time <laughs> where these these like Pentecostal ladies and like we we rebuke the nicotine demon, we rebuke the depression demon, and I was like, "You are that demon." <laughs> You're look, the one. Look, like, what they're trying to do goodness. is what they're trying to do is quasi spiritualize attacking the kingdom of darkness. Because if you read that sermon by Jonathan Edwards, he lays it out flat from a biblical pattern that one of the true marks of, of, of revival is a, an attack on the kingdom of darkness. But guess what? That attack was at his, very, at his hardest right after Jesus ascended into heaven and he kicked the devil out of the kingdom of darkness. That kingdom of darkness has been vacant. There's no one sitting on the throne of Satan anymore. And we've been robbing the Egyptians, bro. We've been plundering all these kingdoms ever since Jesus left the earth and ascended into glory. So that kingdom of darkness has been attacked and has been plundered and we're plundering now. Right. And Jesus is putting his, his enemies under his footstool. That's the way to do it. That's the proper attack of the kingdom from a superior strength, well, glorious point of view. None of this, you know, uh, word salad type stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if he's in six, like, like, right. All the, the, the elements, of warfare are applications of something redemptive, right? The breastplate of Christ's righteousness, the, you know, your, your sandals with the gospel of peace, like the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Like all that is everything to do with like the historic ongoing efficacy of the gospel, right? Um, not Harry Potter, you know, um, new age kind of like uh no, 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 i got the power yeah yeah <laughs> or, or or second corinthians 10 like we destroy arguments and every uh lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of god and we take every thought captive to obey every christ thought. right right so so if you um, have a thought yeah. that that's unbiblical and if you're not you know submitting that thought or or conforming that thought to biblical principles to the to the to the to the bible yeah. you have not been revived yet in yeah. the spirit and it's not You're probably not regenerate yeah. if, you, and if it's your not, thoughts are not conforming to the bible and and, it, and the strongholds that we destroy it's not i i heard this in these kind of movements all the times so i hear it's like we 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 destroy you know depression we just destroy you know, anxiety, and we destroy doubt. It's like, no, no, like we destroy idols that compete for the supremacy of Jesus, you know? Right. Um, that's the thing. It's like, it, it's it's every everything that makes something that is not the Lord himself um, supreme um, is that which we oppose, you know? So, like, what, do we see, you know, so what do we see, Aldo? Um, I know I, I briefly talked about it, right? Um, but what what is it that that we see happen in Nineveh? Oh with yeah, the, with revival, the, the revival and reformation, and and the what actually happens when when God when people enters the heart enters this area um, uh, of our life, and and what are the effects of that? 
yeah. nationally, yeah. nationally, not just you know personally, but then yeah. the far-reachingness of it uh, nationally. That's, that's a great point because one of the things that I, I mean, I um, you know, I'm Westminster uh, Reform, so you know, we're going back to like the Covenanters, and um, when you look at revival in the Old Testament, when you look at revival in in, in Nineveh, which is not a Jewish nation. When you look at revival, you know, historically um, in Rome, uh, when you look at revival, you know, in, in, uh, in England, Scotland, Germany, when you look at revival, even in, in America, it affected every sphere of society. People in power repented and ordered their, their spheres according to the kingship of Christ. You know, the family sphere was changed. The vocational sphere was, was changed. Like, revival is not... A bunch of people having nice, uh, you know, um, hallelujah, you know, uh, moments with Jesus um, at a chapel service, like biblical revival, like literally permeates the totality of every sphere and an entire geography feels the effects of the gospel. You're not going to have like, <laughs> you're not going to have to. Uh, you're not going to have to go into like a chapel service to find God reviving. Like mm -hmm. you see this, just any, just, just study any revival. All spheres, lower, higher, um, are affected. I, I love, I love how like the Scots said, man, every, every Bible, every family had a Bible in Scotland at one point, you know, every parish had a minister, right? Um, Amen. and, and, and the Kings, were, were doing Psalms to stuff. They were they were yeah. kissing the sun. None Praise of this God. like you know hyper privatized. Praise you know, and by the way, this isn't even a church, guys. This is a nonprofit. It's, and, it's a university. Yeah, right. That's, that's another that's that, that's another conversation. That's another element of the conversation. <laughs> is where, where, where does it it's, happen? It's, right? The title the title of the of the Where's place. The is a, <laughs> where are the elders? Yeah. Where are the elders? Yeah. yeah. Revival is sphere comprehensive, not churchianity contained. Mm -hmm. And it's it's let historically, I'm not saying that other people in the church don't have a role to play, but I'm talking about the spearhead of revival is always church officers, pastors. Right. And in, in the book of Acts, you see that. Um, you know, in in in, in history, you see that. Uh, revivals are not led by non-profits and non-ordained people that's just not it's not how god works and we can and we can even and we can even go to acts when you see when you see what happens at, at pentecost and the results thereof you know they they completely turned the world upside down and uh god in his providence allowed for all of those people from different nations um, to hear the word of God be exalted in their own language, and what happened? Did they did they stay there until they died, just worshiping and holding hands? No, they went back to their nations and they proclaimed the gospel in their language, in mm -hmm. their particular context. So, mm -hmm. just to the point that you're making, all it's not something that just yeah. stays and is confounded yeah. here, but it spreads yeah. and it yeah. conquers and yeah, it really changes hearts, it changes lives. In every sphere of our life, it has an impact. Yeah. It has and, to and, have an impact for and, it to and be how, yeah. how would how would this be revival um, that would affect repentance in all the spheres if nothing about this is repenting for and re and, and de demanding repentance for the evil and wickedness mm. of the nation and the kings? Um, and the church, you see, like, if you don't hate the unrighteousness, if you don't speak, you know, like if you're, if you're, if you're not, if you're not Daniel, if, if you're not Ezekiel, if you're not Jeremiah and you see all of society and it's, and it's wickedness and you don't weep over it and you don't speak against it, like how on earth could you consider a movement that has nothing to do with that, Right. Um, as being revival. I mean, let, just, just we can go all over the place. Just look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist was supposedly like a revivalistic preacher. And, and what did he do? You know, he said, yo, Herod, you can't have her. Repent. You know what I'm saying? Like, like 
like biblical revival looks at culture and context, looks at the compromised church. He was telling that to and, the king. And, and stands, yeah, and stands between the gap of heaven and earth and says, thus says the Lord. Like that's that's the historical narrative of, of, of prophets. You know, and I, and not, I would not, not, not just a bunch of, what, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Regard, and, and that, what you're saying, in light of the very clear consequences of preaching the gospel, because John the Baptist, there was a severe consequence for what it is that he did. Mm -hmm. And we all yeah. know how his life ended. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. same thing with the apostles, right? So then and, and a lot of the prophets were also killed because yeah. of the message of um of that they were bringing. Yeah. So, and, so all, all these things also yeah. there's a severe consequence for, yeah. for the bringing of the purity of the gospel. So and, let, let, go ahead. Just one thought. And historically, revival always points the uh, the finger at the particular sins that are cherished by a culture. If you look, you know, at idolatry, a, a lot of times people ask like Whitfield, you know, like what, why do you preach, you know, about uh, drunkenness, you know, like, because he would go into a place and understand what is every, every people and situation has a unique way ex of expressing their idolatry. And the true the true uh, preacher who is concerned with revival, he will point the finger at the choice delicacy of depravity and demand for people to repent and bring it to Christ. And you know what's funny about that? But what's, what's really funny is that there's been people that are homosexual, okay, that have looked at this movement and said, this is going to be great um, for people like myself, right? Like that's how, so how could you, this person that expresses a particular unique delicacy of depravity um, and they're not really uncomfortable with your quote unquote revival because revival makes the particular delicacies of depravity very uncomfortable um, by virtue of, of what they're doing. And, and um, that's not what we see here with some of right. these. Uh, May, um, Paul Washer, Paul Washer would say you have to make much of sin. You have to make much of sin before you make much, much of the grace of God. Like you can't get to the grace of God without understanding the the the, the deepness and the darkness of your own sin. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and 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 I think we're talking about the red flags here. So Pastor Aldo, let's go ahead and do a blitzkrieg style questionnaire to help the listeners. Think critically about potential red flags, right? Slow down when, when you're driving through a, a foggy county, right? Before you end up in a ditch. So real quick, and I, I think we touched this, but let people think about this. Does revival mean, hey, I must go join a church now and submit to church government? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> there's many people out there saying, I don't need to join a church. Man, traditional Christianity it is what's hurting the Asbury revival. It's all you guys that's yeah. putting the wet blanket on us. That's not loving your neighbor, bro. Yeah. Well, you know what? You're not God and you don't get to make up, you know, what revival is. And in God's inspired account of the church, wherever revival went, you know what, you know what Paul did? He appointed elders in every place that were accountable, accountable to a region of elders, which is a presbytery, in order to sustain and uh, you know sustain that that spiritual movement. Mm. Right. So what did what did Paul do? He he appointed local oversight. Right. He didn't appoint staff. Mm. He didn't appoint nonprofits. He he appointed or or marketers. Yes. Are you huh? saying that they don't have coffee shop pastors? <laughs> They don't have coffee shop pastors, and there's what about and, the coffee shop no ministry, bro? The coffee shop ministry. That's fine. I mean, you <laughs> you can do that, but that, that's I mean, that's 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 a Christian, you know, loving his neighbor. That that's not like the spearhead of like uh of of the kingdom of God revival, you know. So yeah, all all this stuff that um is anti church or you know not anti church, but maybe like you know, kind of like suddenly throwing shit in the church like that. That's never God always revive. God always revives through his institution. God said, I will build my church. 
right? And he's speaking mm -hmm. to who? He's speaking to the officers of the church that represent the church, and they pass the keys to, uh, you know, the the elders, right? Mm -hmm. I will build my church. Now, I will build, you know, every Christian doing whatever the heck he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants. I will build my church. Like that is the institution that God has chosen to mm -hmm. use. And it's the institution that he commissions to baptize so that's sacraments and teaching. That's the word of God, right? Um, yeah, this, this is one of the issues in, in our day, man, is like a lot of like stuff that is revivalistic. Um, it, it has nothing to do uh, with local church structures and authority. Um, and mm -hmm. that's just, that isn't he, Here's I another one, because I, I want to go quickly. I'm going to go quickly here. So what you mean, guys, is does revival, like, like guys, you guys are being too harsh. I can hear it already. You guys are being too judgmental and too critical. Like, how dare you throw shade on something positive, right? With all the negativity happening in the world, the earthquakes and, and the World War Threes and everything. And here we have a story about uh, people coming to Jesus. How bad are you guys, like, talking bad about them, right? Because... So basically, here's the question. Does revival mean, as we see it so far, it's just an endless church service, right? Just an endless worship service. So so does revival mean, like, just singing hymns and praying? Like, So wait, wait. So, well, no, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean an endless, an endless church service. You ask your question. I got, you ask multiple questions. But one thing, just go, go to the scriptures, right? And when it talks about the ministry of John the Baptist, you know, that's, that's anticipated like in Malachi and then restated in Luke, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. So revival doesn't look like people getting lost up in these emotional, uh, endless, um, you know, hallelujah circles, bro. Like revival looks like, look, just think about Jesus. Jesus heals somebody, says, go home, pick up your mat and go home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the Ephesian church is like, they're, they're hearing about like this, 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 co this cosmic agenda that is now being like, you know, brought into like its inaugural fruition. And what do we do? Love your wife. Submit to your husbands. Raise your kids in the fear of the Lord. Masters. You know, <laughs> like, like it, yeah. it looks like normal life being re mm -hmm. reordered um, to the to glory the, of God. To the glory of God. Right. Amen. Would, and um, yeah, not, not 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 like that, bro. Like so, so Alex, real quick, uh, does revival mean I have to learn theology now, like like systematic theologies, and like do I have to read sermons? Like, do I have to know my stuff now? Now yeah, that you, I, you, you need to learn your stuff, and true revival of the heart um, should lead us to love um, theology more. Um, orthodoxy leads to um, orthopraxy. We need to understand this God that. Um, has saved us and has given us new life in Christ Jesus. Um, and so wisdom is found in scripture. Um, our knowledge of Christ needs to grow. We need to continuously be transformed and renewed. Um, it's, it's, it's our lifeline, right? Yes. We come, we come to him and we, and we feed from him. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things, if I may, is I, I want to also mention what something like this can also be a sign of. And I, I think that it's safe to say that something like this may potentially be a sign of God's judgment upon people. As we look in, in, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from truth and will turn aside to myths. And so there is an aspect of Asbury um, that potentially or uh, revivals, right, this revivalistic type of mentality where we are seeing that God is um, allowing this to be a sign of judgment for those that are straying from the purity of doctrine. So, yes, we must grow in our knowledge of God according to his word. Um, God has blessed the church throughout the, throughout the years. Um you know, with creeds, confessions, um, the theology is systematic. And so it is very important. It is vital. And it's a sign of growth where you humble yourself Amen. to scripture. Yeah. And when you are discipled. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So when you are true disciples. Amen. So yes. Come on, Acts chapter two. Yes. Yeah, so I encourage Devoted people. Devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. Yep. Acts two forty two. So, so, yep. So fire comes from heaven. They speak in our languages. What are we going to do now? We're going to devote ourselves to what? Fire from heaven. More fire, more fire, fuego otra vez. No, like yeah. they <laughs> devoted themselves to right. the apostles, the doke, doctrine, the breaking of bread. Mm -hmm. That's the word for Lord's Supper and the prayers. That's, 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 yeah. You, 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 man, I want to devote myself to the doctrines of God. Amen. Taught by the apostles. Right. Here's another but one. You said something earlier yep. yesterday that I want to touch on. And that mm -hmm. was the whole thing about like, why are you, why are you, you know, knocking on this? That's not nice. Mm -hmm. You know, like, bro, which Jesus is this Jesus? That's what I want to, want to, want to, you know, push back on. Is it the Jesus that comes on, a, that is seen as on a white horse, you know, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It, it is the Jesus of Daniel 7, where all the nations are gathered before him to pay tribute. Is it the Jesus who tells the kings, repent and kiss me or perish? Is, is it the Jesus who says, if you don't hate your mother and father and not even your own life, you cannot be my disciple? Is it the Jesus that says to the Pharisees with all of their so-called sincerity, you are twofold sons of hell? Like, is, is it that Jesus? Is it the Jesus that rained fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah and burned it? I mean, is it that Jesus? If that's if that's a Jesus, then yeah, I'm all, I'm, I'm all good for that. But the thing is, the he gets us Jesus, the Asbury Jesus, is this postmodern, feministic, reduced, less than actual comprehensive Christ that can't do nothing for anybody except make them feel good about themselves. Correct. And, and so, yeah, 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 we're being mean because, listen, like, we're, we're zealous for the actual Jesus, right, who is Amen. not just a prophet, not just a priest, but also a king. King, and yeah. not just a king in heaven, but but the king of kings and lord of lords, right? Who um, is much more than what is being presented. Um, yeah, a lot of people yeah, say know, you mean haters, man. Mean. I know what you mean when you said that we're being mean because that's how it is. That's how it's being uh, uh, perceived, right? If you if you draw a hard line on the sand and you're saying and you're standing there pointing your finger. Um, it's perceived a certain way, but what they don't want to come to grips with is that they are in a false uh, spirituality, devoid of the true essence of what and who Christ is. And so um, uh, it says more about the listener than it does about the person that is proclaiming these truths, um, because we're seeking for true reformation that comes from pure doctrine um, and that there, there's a lot of work that 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 um, that has to be done in order for you to get there. It's not just like I'm going to sit there and look for fires and look for places to go so that I can uh, get more more of a, of a frenzy. And then yeah. God is going to supernaturally just out of, out of nowhere, zap me with this wisdom to heal or to, you know, whatever. So the version of Christ that they're presenting, just like Aldo said, is a weak, feministic, emotional uh, temperamental, um, you know, uh, I just want to help you in a horizontal sense, Jesus. Um, yeah, it's, it's, G it's, it, it, it's, it's a glorified girlfriend, bro. You know, and I think like, like, mm. I just want to, a lot of things that I've heard here is like, you know, love of Christ and love of Christ. Okay, love of Christ. If you don't know that God hates you apart from Christ, you don't know anything about God loving you. And that's why before we get Romans 5, 6, God proves his own love for us. We, we get Romans 1. The wrath of God is real from heaven against all unrighteousness. And it talks about the exchange, the glory of the God. And God gave them over to the corruption, right? They are haters of God. And then it talks about, you know, it goes all the way in chapter 3, right? And then there's none righteous, no, not one. Their, their throat is an open grave, you know. The whole world is condemned, judged, right? And, you know, when Paul does all that, he, he then starts talking about, like, the love of God that propitiates the anger of God in light of unrighteousness. But all this stuff that is about love, God loving us without understanding like his righteous indignation over depravity, it, it is therapeutic, sentimental uh, paganism. It, it's not biblical worship of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like but if bro, you don't bro. believe 
that you should have been crucified, that you should have been, uh, you know, mangled, that you should have been sent to the lake of fire and experienced right. the, the, if you don't believe that you deserve that on your best day, then you don't, you ain't talking about the love of Jesus. You're, you're talking the about the love, the love of yourself that you have projected on a fantasy Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the beginning conversation of the gospel, right? That actually goes into our next topic of today. And I know we're late, better late than never. Right. Is yeah, but bro, that's not marketable, bro. That's not charitable, bro. charitable, bro. Like that's not the God Jesus that I'm seeing. You must read a different Jesus, bro. Because you know, the, the Jesus I know you know, the Jesus I know is that he, he he's like me, bro. He gets us. You know what I mean? And this actually goes to, uh, let me give Alex a break there. This actually goes into the Super Bowl advertisement of he gets us. What is your first impression? I'm not sure. Did, did you watch it live on the Super Bowl or maybe the day after? Or how I, did I, you I, see yeah, it? I, I, I I've seen all those he gets us ads before. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what what was your first impressions on it when you first saw it? What was your first thought? My on first it? impression on it is um Jesus shares our concerns from our worldview. Um and in light of him pretty much being where we're at about life, uh, in, in light of him kind of just kind of being, you know a lot like us <clears throat> in the things that bother us and him being very similar to us. Um, therefore, you know, you know, G Jesus hates racist people. You hate racist people like Jesus, you know, Jesus, you know, he, he was rejected like, you know, and, and outcast and you guys from the hood, you know, like, you, like basically like it is not making an appeal to the distinctiveness of Christ and how, because he is different um, and very unique, um, that you should look to him. It was very, it, it was pretty much seeking to make a case for, because Jesus is pretty much a lot like you and just one of your peers, um, then that's, that's the appeal. Right. Um, so that was, that was my impression. Right. So yeah, you're, you're a revolutionary. Yeah. Jesus revolutionary. You know, mm -hmm. you're like, a, a, a you're, you're lonely, you know, like Jesus is lonely. Like, and so it's, it's wow. not exactly making you aware as to why you need Jesus, um, for your vertical issues. It, it was more just, Hey man, all, all the things that like you naturally and normally and intuitively are concerned with, you know, Jesus is right there with you. Right. And so I don't know. It, it, he gets yeah. us was like, I interpret that as like, you don't get God. Ooh. Yeah, I, I, I thought of it and I was like, whoa, what kind of commercials? Because when I, I watch the Super Bowl all the time and I know many people don't like me because I just said that, but I watch it and I watched that commercial and I was like, oh, is this Black Lives Matter? Like that's the first because I had no idea who, you know, this organization was or anything. And I just watched it with my naked eyes and I was like, is this a Black Lives Matter commercial? Like what's going on here? And then I was like, my wife, I told my wife, I was like, this is a Black Lives Matter commercial. Like, what? And then at the end, I was like, he gets us Jesus. And I was like, oh, snaps. It it was a, yeah, yeah. a, a Christian commercial. I was like, what? Yeah, I was confused. It's a, it's a low view. It's a low view of who God is. It's a low mm. view of Christ. Um, and it's a high, a much higher view of man. Mm. So it, it, no, it, the, yeah, go ahead. But the thing is, like, Jesus didn't walk around saying, I get you. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> he walked around saying, you don't get God. And I'm here to reveal the Father to you, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. the message of Jesus is not like, yo, I, I get you, man. It's like, no, like, you don't get God. And that's why you need a mediator between God and man who reveals the Father um, in a way that demands your repentance um, and reception, Right? Um, and he transcends, and he transcends uh, your socioeconomic status. It, it it doesn't that doesn't matter whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you know when it, what they're presenting is a view of Christ that he um, only is concerned with a certain class 
economic or socioeconomic class of people. Yeah. Hey guys, and what's the what's ironic about that is that they spent a hundred million dollars in this marketing campaign. So that's that they exactly can what I thought, bro. A low, view, a low view of Christ. That's exactly yeah. what I thought because I was like, you know, I'm not I'm not a fool. You know, mama didn't raise no fool. I'm like, dude, how much it costs to make a Super Bowl commercial? Like one minute, it's like a million dollars every 30 seconds or whatever. Like they spend how much money? Do we even know how much money they spend on this commercial ad for this Super Bowl reach? Like you know, I, mean? I would always I would always mention like darkness always sides with darkness because it's not like if you're you're it's it's not just uh, the paying, but they have to approve the commercial as well. Um, and so uh, for for the world to approve this message of Jesus, you know, also kind of speaks to the fact that they are not presenting the true biblical Jesus, because if they were, they would not allow that commercial, regardless of how much they paid to be played on, on such a large, um, uh, large venue. Yeah, millions. Pastor E said millions. Yeah, it costs millions of dollars. So I'm thinking like, well, it costs 20 man, million. People... It costs twenty million to get onto the Super Bowl, but they, as a campaign, they mm -hmm. have spent a hundred million dollars um, as a marketing campaign yeah. from the moment that it started. Twenty million this, for Super Bowl ads. Said this goes back to our original issue with Asbury. It's like, okay, how does God work? How does God work? The message of the cross is is what Paul says. He says, uh, you know, it, it is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, man seeks, you know, Greeks seek wisdom and the Jews look for power, but we preach Christ crucified. So I'm, I'm kind of like mixing and matching verses. The idea that we're going to be able to uh, win, right? We're going to be able to win uh, people to the Lord, not by the message of the cross, right? But by some gimmicky, therapeutic, Marxistic, you know, like sentimental, uh, horizontal, uh, like, like, it's just ridiculous. Like we don't, God, the, the thing with the Asbury and like the, how they diminish Christ in some way and, and dilute him and present him in a way that's palatable or, you know, that he gets us. The more that you naturalistically present um, God the less you need a supernatural means to convert men. The more you naturalistically present Christ and don't, you know, through the, you know, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. And him. I, I did not come to you with lofty speech, right? Like the more you, you add things or subtract things to make Jesus naturally appealing based upon what you naturally have apart from regeneration, the more you don't need the spirit of God. Therefore, you can't even talk about revival because you don't even need something supernatural to get you to believe this because it's something that you would, you would be inclined to believe if you didn't know God, you know? Um, so real so, quick, what's the, what's the philosophical implications, um, Pastor Aldo, as he gets us? Like, um, I think we talked about it, but like maybe we could just like zoom in real quick on that philosophical implication, Right that he gets us, um, you know, so those who are listening could, could get it when they leave this live stream. I want them to get it. Like, wh what do they mean by he gets us? What do they mean? Yeah. Wh 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 what is the phil philosophical, you know, apologetical thing that they're trying to point across? It's like, I mean, point. I mean, to me, to me, it's postmodernism, right? Okay. How so? Like, how, how is he gets us postmodern? So the subject, um, the subjective is what is objective. So what is truth? Is truth outside of you? Is truth something that is revealed to you? Or is truth something that is discovered within you? Um, and so this he gets us is trying to present Jesus not as the one who has an objective truth outside of us to present to us, but presenting Jesus as if your natural, normal, subjective, whatever you think is good and right, um, according to that, 
according to the objectivity that's in you, we're accommodating Jesus to that. Does it make sense? So you think right. Jesus, you, you think Christ should be like this. Mm. In light of what you, in light of your postmodern world that, that, you know, what God is, but what God is not, what is right and wrong is, is subject to you. And so we're going to present Jesus to you in a way that is conducive to your statue that you created in your heart and this worldview by which everything that you know about everything is from the inside out, not the outside in. That's, that's how I you know, process it. Yeah, I, w- I would say that they're fashioning a, a, an idol of Christ. They're making Christ in their own image. Yeah. Um, and every, yeah, and everything about Christ that is offensive, it's actually not the real Christ. Everything about Christ is that, 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 that you think is Christian is not actually the real Jesus. Actually, you, you've you been misled. You know all, all those Bible thumpers, right? You know, they talk about like, you know, homosexuality and the law of God and hell and, you know, and atonement and wrath, and propitiation and holiness, like all those things. Like, bro, you, that's, that's not, the, that's not, yeah, you guys familiar with the quest for the historical Jesus? Yeah. The quest for the historical Jesus. It was, just, it was this thing by like, like, like liberals in academia. And it's like, was there's it, a Jesus. Was, was it Lee Strobel? Is it Lee Strobel or? No, no, no. There's a Jesus of the scriptures, right? Hmm. But then there's the real Jesus underneath the scriptures. And so this is what it is. Like, yeah, you know, you know, you know, Jesus in the Bible, like the one who like uh <laughs> um did what he did and said what he said. Um there 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 is a a Jesus underneath the scriptures that has been hijacked by you know all the uh, epistemological authority of of, of unregenerate ideology. Um, and so it's like there, there's a Jesus you don't know that you think you know, um, and it's the one that pretty much it, it's like it's like the Jefferson Bible. Everything supernatural, everything offensive, everything Gosh. that that you have a problem with, we've removed it, and here he is, right? And so they they selectively present elements of Jesus um, that accommodate him to be according to like their idolatrous presuppositions about what God should be like. And it's, I think someone in the chat said something very interesting. Um, it's pretty much, um, it's the Jesus that, that, it's the Jesus that is the fantasy of neo-Marxist university elites is the actual Jesus. That's what I would say. Hmm. The Jesus that is a fantasy, an idol of neo-Marxist academia elites is the actual Jesus of the scriptures. You didn't know that. You didn't know that. But actually... Now you know. Now you know. Now you know. Yeah, you know this this, uh, this Che Guevara ish revolutionary ish. Yeah, yeah. Collectivism ish. Yeah. It's the uh, Jesus that the Jesus that will that will be mar- If he was around, he'd be marching with bisexual lesbian Marxists. You know who rob the poor to live in million dollar houses. Like that's the that's it's that Jesus. You know, right. it's the one that's going to change the world by the perverse demonic system of communism. Right. Oof. Um, uh, Pastor Aldo, that goes into my my you know the, maybe the last point here. How does he gets us tells us where we are theologically, where we are as a nation, where we are culturally? Because that's what you're talking about. So let, let let's end it and let's park right here on the way out. How does that one advertisement or those two advertisements? How does that tell us where we're at? Uh, you said it already. We're under God's judgment. Mm. We're under God's judgment. Like we, we what, have. What are some signs of God's the judgment? Most, the most. Po- well, I mean, the like, thing is, at least in the context of the United States. You know what I mean. So zoom in. <laughs> like, United what, what States. What's the question? Like, what are the you, signs you, of God's judgment in the United States? Right, because you're saying that. People well, can't, people can't, when, when the word of God is preached, they don't, they don't recognize it and they're confused okay. by it. So notice like, notice something like how oftentimes when you actually preach the Bible, people are like, what are you talking about? That's, that's not biblical. So mm. like the, the word of God is like a strange thing, like on Isaiah's day. Right. right? Um, when you have uh, excess ungodliness, right. In, in the leadership, you know, it's a sign of God's judgment. Uh, when churches 
you know, um, are syncretistically infusing like the, the, the cultural ideologies with the church. Like that's a sign of God's judgment. Um, when church discipline is no longer done, that's a sign of God's judgment, right? Um, when, um, when the worship of God has been corrupted um, and we bring all of the, the Baals uh, and the images of, of the pagans into our temple like they did in Israel, like that's, that's a sign of God's judgment. When we're not worshiping God the way he told us, but we're going up on the hills and, and, and seeking to find God in, in our own way, that's a sign of God's you know, judgment. Um, I think it's, it's just, even, when, even, when, when, huh? even allowing the, the allowance of the, um, of the homosexuals to, uh, lead worship in a church. Um, yeah. Yeah. the, the yeah. lack, the lack of true, of true biblical masculinity leading their children to Christ, um, being, being the men that they need to in their home. Um, I think that's also a, a sign of that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and I think just the, the 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 lawlessness of the people of God. I mean, if you talk to if you talk to the average Christian, do you believe that homosexuality should be a crime? Ask the average Christian that question. Do, do you think homosexuality is a crime? Do and they will say no. Do you think that people who slaughter their children um, should be subject to capital punishment? They'll tell you no, and, and what you, what you, when, when you hear that, you, you, you come to understand that through revivalism and dispensationalism, most Christians are antinomian and don't believe that the law of God actually is a standard, and they believe that pagan autonomy, pagan autonomy and anarchy is actually good and moral, and the law of God and the penalties that God prescribes for certain things is utterly brutal and insane and inhumane and unJesus like. I mean, barbaric, barbaric, barbaric. yeah, yeah, out, out of touch, uh, old, um, uh, meant meant only for a previous uh, epoch, uh, not for our modern uh, right. time. Yeah. Many people would like when, to say, "Well, when, the God of the when, Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, right?" Yeah, and also when you see when you see churches that are controlled by 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 the state what i mean by controlled by the state i don't mean like in some like maybe like uh tyrannical sense but like whatever the state says is important the church now becomes the puppet and mouthpiece of the state so the state is talking about homosexuality as an issue so now we're we're, we're, we're homosexuality advocates the state is talking about like you know the the blm stuff so now the church is the mouthpiece of the state the church is talking about vax the, the state is talking about vaccines and now we're talking about vaccines whatever the state says um is the preoccupation and concern of the world here comes the russell moores right here comes a tim keller here comes all these big eva folks and gospel coalition basically puppeting whatever the ideological elites in in, in the state are saying and then using the Bible to shame Christians that this is Christianity, you know. And if you look at something about, about Revelation 13, notice something. Whenever God corrupts government, it becomes a beast, right? Mm. So government is supposed to be God's deacon, Romans 13. But whenever it becomes, uh, you know, something anti-Christ uh, serving, it becomes beast-like. And then the second beast is one that speaks on behalf of the first beast and exalts the power of the. So basically, it, it corrupts Christianity into yeah. being nothing more than a little minion and puppet of humanistic power that's anti God. And if you think about like what 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 is this homosexuality you know stuff, abortion stuff, you know eclectic stuff, you know postmodernism stuff, you know like the the, the the COVID cult stuff, like what is all this in the church for? Because we have, whether we realize it or not, we become little minions that just simply parrot whatever the powers of this age want us to parrot, right? Mm. And and so if you look at like all this stuff, it's really just, okay, like what does the people in power think is most concerning, most most supreme, and now the church has become pretty much, instead of being a mouthpiece of God unto the powers of this age, they've been co-opted to be simply nothing more than deacons and, and minions of the powers of this age. But they Christianize their paganism, 
right? Um, and so, yeah, like we're, we're under judgment, man. And, and so how do we come back? How do we come back from that? How do we, how do we then now come back um, uh, to, to a, a true, true Christianity, biblical Christianity? So how do we go from a, he gets us and Asbury to uh, true revivalism, to true reformation, uh, uh, crucifying the flesh, walking after Christ, exalting him, et cetera. So how, how is it that we get there? I mean, the simple answer is just find find a church that is that is uh, that is doing that, and take your family there, and seek to build that church up as much as you can, um, so that you know over time, you know we can begin to multiply um, healthier churches. I think one of the things that people do now they tend to like have like the my I know my church is compromised. I know my pastors are little minions of big state. You know, I, I know like they're trying to like make some kind of like truce between Baal and Christ. Um, but you know what? Like I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to tithe here. I'm going to serve here. Like, I really think that Christians need to really quickly um, and sooner rather than later support um, healthy churches um, for the long term future and and not waste another dime, another minute. Um, in these places that are really just doing nothing for Christ, they're doing nothing for the kingdom of God, and they're doing nothing for for, for the average saint. You know that that's one practical thing. You, you you need to find yourself in a faithful, simple, God centered, biblically worshiping, ordinary means of grace. You know, church disciplining, practicing church. Very simple. Amen. It's simple, but it's hard, hard to find, man. There's you gotta like Ooh. go through the the wilderness, man. Ooh. Uh yeah, we 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 have to move. Uh <laughs> we have to pray for those people who need to move. How about that? But you know what's funny? You know what's funny? <laughs> people leave California because the job situation is awful. Why wouldn't you do that for a church situation, bro? If all your pastors are woke in your area, you know, then 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 move, bro. I mean. I don't know. I think yeah, I think yeah. I think we, we need to really just rally around because the thing is like a lot of the guys that, that you never know and never heard of, man, like and you've never seen and they don't have a podcast, like they're pastoring faithful churches. You know, they're just they're they're just not viral, you know. Right. Um, and I also think practically speaking, like, you know, I, I think that we have to um I mean, I don't know. We're, we're wrapping up, but I mean, you, you gotta, you, you gotta take, you gotta take your part of part of the reason why all these kids are into all of this, you know, spiritual garbage is they've been indoctrinated by the religion of of state education. Yeah. That's 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 my fundamentalist that's take. Whole, that's a whole nother uh, <laughs> can of worms. <laughs> Man, you keep opening up can of worms. All yeah, right, bro. bro. I, I mean, say, like, what do you expect? I, I you would expect? say, I would say, I would say. You know, I think that we will glorify the Lord most in um, leading our children well, right? Amen. Understanding and growing in, in our knowledge of the word, um, uh, leading our wives well, um, participating as much as possible in the local in the local church, um, supporting and praying for your elders, for your for your deacons and for your pastors, um, and and uh, participating in fellowship, opening up your home uh, for those people um, in, in your church. Um, but again, mostly just disciple your children, you know, lead your wife well, uh, grow in sanctification, grow in knowledge of the word and apply uh, the Lord's word in uh, whatever context it is that you find yourself in. Um, whatever it is that you're doing, do it for the glory of Christ. Wherever it is that you find yourself, do it for the glory of Christ. If you need to move because you need to get somewhere that's teaching uh, uh, Bible, teaching the Bible faithfully, then you, that's something that you do have to definitely do. Um, but I would just say that, bro. And what Pastor what Pastor Aldo said, in your ordinary day, ordinary means, glorify the Lord, lead your children well, lead your family well, and support Amen. your local church. Amen. Part, and so, part of like I think that is <laughs> you need to not go to a church that is just preparing a bunch of anemic losers for heaven. Oof. Yes, that's one of the one, one one of the reasons why I think. We have all of this, uh, these issues is dispensationalism, you know, plus other forms of pietism has convinced Christians that all we're doing here 
is having nice feelings for Jesus in our little circles of church in Yanny, um, while we wait for some afterlife. And so I, I think you need to find yourself in a church that is preparing you um, to live in the present for the kingdom of God and Christ um, with that small mustard seed growing into a large tree optimism that sees all of your life right now as significant unto the Lordship of Christ as you wait the consummation, man. Like, I think one of the reasons why our, our country um, is is so uh, morally uh, corrupt is that we've convinced most Christians that the world is supposed to be demonic. It's inevitably going to be a cesspool of demonism. And so on. in the meantime, just, just evangelize people, have nice feelings for Christ, while you, you know, get ready for the afterlife. I mean, you, you got to find yourself in a church that has much more of a comprehensive view of the Lord's doings um, in this present day. Because afterlife exclusive Christianity has proven itself to be the most miserable, pathetic failure in the history of the West. And that, because, you know, <laughs> Anyways, uh, all right, we're going to go ahead and close it out. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, go ahead and follow Pastor Aldo on Twitter. Go ahead and hit him up on uh, Kingdom Polemics. Got, hey, right now it's Gospel on Tap, but go ahead and follow him on Kingdom Polemics podcast. Follow me on uh, Bible Theory on YouTube. And Alex, uh, where um, I have your link below, but where is your um, Instagram handle feed again? Instagram is the Presby proselyte and the same for Twitter. Um, and that's what I have for now. Hey, all, all right. So can um, I, can I know I say I, one more thing. All right. One more thing. One more thing. Go on. We got to go. Listen. No, Edwin, come I'm not going to talk on. about, I'm not going to talk <laughs> about made, that. We may, we, we're, we're going to have to do it on the, a part two, bro. Right. Gonna, yeah, right. But, but right. Let me right, say right. this. Look, if, if you find yourself in a revival, Okay. <laughs> Let's go. And, and, go home. And, and you got a bunch of grown men groping each other in a hug circle on the floor. <laughs> Run out of that building. Flee. <laughs> and never come back there, bro. Amen. Let me tell you something, man. The spirit of God in light of the glory of God it's not going to make you act like a silly, sentimental, sappy chick on the floor, bro. It's Amen. not. Amen. <laughs> like chick. It's not. Amen. It's not. It's going to be like, you know what? I need to stop playing guitar hero, you know, and masturbating. You know, I, I, need, to, I need to find myself a wife. I need to have a job. Now you go, not get on a hug circle. You know, on the floor, groping men, bro. That, I mean, that, that that that's just common sense. It's common sense. So that that ain't revival. That's 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 some chick stuff. <laughs> I, let oh, me not man. say what I was gonna say. I'll, I'll, I'll all right. So um, in the Save beginning, it for part two. Save it for part two. All right, there's gonna be a part two. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll hit you up on that. So in the beginning, we had technical difficulties with my intro, and I don't know why what happened. So uh, scratch that. Let me go ahead and show you the intro, a.k.a. outro, for the last statement. God bless you. I was in Canada, in Banff, Alberta and received a, a message that I was to call the academic dean. And when I called him, he told me the chapel for that day was not over. It was seven o'clock Kentucky time at night. And I suddenly was aware that something had happened that I had never seen, never experienced. And uh, I pursued that with him to question him and began to realize that it was an unusual movement of the spirit. Um, and so we want to just show that confounding love of Jesus Christ 
to America and showed it his example and his teachings and his life really uh, hold up the answers to our modern day challenges that we're facing individually and as a society. Revival, look left, and I look left, and there's this young college woman getting prayed over by an older woman. And he says, look right, and then there's this young guy praying over an older guy. And he says, look behind you, and everyone's just raising their hands. And he said, Gage, this is revival. It isn't hype. It's ordinary people crying out for a move of God in our generation. And I'm here to talk to everybody in this room who is hungry. What an honor. What an honor. Because you might just need to test out the fruits and test out the spirits of it. And I'm just honestly, I'm so fed up with so much religious tradition that is really just dampening the move of God that is coming across this country. And you can feel the thickness of his glory. And I don't even know how to say it or how to explain it. But it was worth the flight and it was worth the drive, you know. And you do remember, Phil, that in the early uh, years of that movement, they attached the arrival of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to that experience. Right. So that became the foundational kind of identifying mark of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And once that got embedded in the movement, it, it just it stuck.